power scaling is fine, and people both outside of and inside of the community do not seem to understand it. If you do not know what power scaling is, you aren't watching any video on this channel in the first place, but if you don't, somehow, allow me to explain. This all stems from the simple question, who would win in a fight between two or more characters from various fictional properties? I have to word it that way because there are actually a lot of questions with the same sort of logical through line, but normally, you take two characters, usually from different franchises, and you find out who wins. Presto, you have yourself a versus match. Power scaling is the process by which people will go over all the media that a character has. We'll talk about that down the line. I actually forgot to. Um, the whole point was just going to be that sometimes people composite, sometimes people don't. It's entirely subjective what you think the, the limitations to compositing should be when it comes to stuff like this anyway. And categorize all the feats, statements, and comparisons made by and between characters. Often then, if required, mathematics and science will come into play to give these various feats a sense of scale between one another, so the comparison can be made easier. For example, saying that Dio's stingy eyes can output a million tons of TNT, compared to Alucard being capable of withstanding a few tons of TNT, is a lot more easily comparable and understandable than saying Dio is powerful enough to part clouds in the sky while Alucard can survive blowing up the coolest plane ever made. This is not a point for you to start arguing over whether either feat is usable or who wins between them. It doesn't matter, it's just an example. Usually this sort of thing will also be used for calculating a character's speed in relation to others. Attack potency, durability, and speed will then be categorized for easier and more concise discussion. In tiers such as mountain level or faster than light. Then the comparison between whatever characters can delve further into their abilities, skills, and experience, how they match and counter one another, do the blah blah, and boom, you've got a winner. What's so confusing about that? Apparently fucking everything. Now I'm not here to cast a massive wide net and say that every single person gets all of these things wrong, or even to say that I'm necessarily 100% correct, because in the end, a lot of this can be and is subjective in nature, and to apply objectivity to your own opinion is a bit arrogant and conceited, and I guess making this video is already a bit arrogant and conceited of me. But there are a lot of people who, in my personal opinion, don't seem to understand what things mean and what the point of it all is. Which in some regards is not just on them, but also on the community dedicated to power scaling for coming across the way we do. Where do I start? Well, I guess we can start where we just left off. Tiers! When it comes to calculations, they often get placed in tiers, and a lot of people, especially outsiders of the community, tend to mistakenly believe that the tiers used reflect the raw destructive potential of whatever the name would suggest. People will, and understandably so sometimes, expect that a character labeled as Mountain Level would be capable of destroying a mountain. That's not always the case. Characters do not always demonstrate their power in pure destructive feats all the time, and there can be a difference between the pure attack potency and the scale of an attack, but it is all built on some manner of logic even if it doesn't make the most immediate sense. Let's take a look at a popular example. This is Son Goku. You know him, that is a fact. Goku from the earliest days of online battleboarding has been considered a character who, at minimum, can destroy a planet. I'm not here to argue whether or not he should be higher, that is a minimum that people accept generally. But that might not seem obvious to someone who has seen the show or read the manga, because rarely do fights in Dragon Ball ever reach that scale. In fact, in the original Dragon Ball manga, the only characters to destroy planets on panel are Frieza and I believe Majin Buu, but don't quote me on that, it has been a while since I've read it, with characters like Piccolo and Master Roshi coming in just under at being able to blow up the moon. And these characters never do so in the middle of battle. However, the reasoning that would support such seemingly outlandish claims of these characters' power being planetary is based within some manner of science, primarily Newton's third law of motion which in simple terms is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The action being, say, Piccolo fires a beam, and the equal and opposite reactions are the beam destroys the moon, and his body needs to be able to withstand the force of his own attack, otherwise it would be destroyed as well. And if you're confused, go argue it with actual physicists. This is a law of physics. This is why attack potency and durability are often synonymous, because to be able to generate a certain amount of energy, your body also needs to be able to take it back which I understand can seem counterintuitive sometimes. You can stab someone with a knife, but that doesn't mean you can survive being stabbed. Or, a tank can fire a shell, but that doesn't mean it could survive that shell fired back at it. 
Again, first of all, if you're going to argue against Newton's third law, you can argue against the fundamental law of physics with some physicists over that, you go ahead. But the reason this is the case is that the reaction back on you is across your entire body. When you stab someone, which I say as if you're definitely going to do that, you are still withstanding the same force that you're applying. However, on you, the force of that stab is going across your whole body. It's distributed across your person. While on the person being shanked, the stabbing force is focused entirely into the surface area of that blade entering their body. The same goes for a tank. The force of the blast is distributed across the tank. That's why tanks and all firearms have recoil. But for the target, it's distributed right in the fuck you range of the tank shell hitting them. Ergo, while Piccolo, as the example, may not necessarily have durability that's exactly one-to-one -one completely equal to the moon-destroying feat, it is within a similar range that it's close enough. So, when Nappa hits him and kills him, we understand that this must mean that Nappa is dishing out more power than Piccolo can withstand, which means it must be higher than Piccolo's own attack. The logic does make sense, even if it is initially counterintuitive. And that counterintuitive nature can be what stumps people initially. Nappa didn't destroy a moon with this attack, it's not even that big an impact, but it logically could not have less power than that other attack if it could fucking kill Piccolo. The reason the tiers are worded as they are is because it's easier to explain. Typing out exact values in every conversation can be annoying, and people love shorthand for things. This is not a thing exclusive to the Versus community. Star Trek fans will call each other Trekkies instead of Star Trek fans all the time. Fate fans will refer to characters as Salter and Jolter instead of Artoria Pendragon Alter and Jean d'Arc Alter. Yu-Gi-Oh players will refer to types of cards as boss monsters or use names alluding to one specific card to refer to a whole type, like with Garnets. All of which are incredibly dorky, but even real people use shorthand often. Think of the times people say selfie instead of picture of myself and things. The versus community, just by the nature of this hobby and what these terms mean to an outside audience, gets misinterpreted. When someone says, usually, I stress usually when someone says that Jotaro Kujo is town level, they're not saying Jotaro Kujo could destroy a town with a single punch, or Jotaro Kujo has destroyed a town with a single punch. They're saying that Jotaro's feats and the feats of those weaker than or equivalent to him are within the range that town level encompasses. Of course, that then leads into the confusion of how can a character be that strong when they just destroy X things all the time. Which leads into, of course, the innately pseudoscientific nature of it all. Now, most of the sensible people in the Versus community, you know, the kind who don't go around harassing others for daring to exercise their spaghetti monster given right to have an opinion, will fully admit that, yeah, Versus debating is very pseudoscientific in its nature. The calculations used, while technically they're accurate, will not always reflect total accuracy in terms of comparison to how a professional physicist would do it. But the reason for this is simple. Uh, we're not physicists. This is a hobby, something done purely for fun that's not to be taken super seriously. Calculations are a case of close enough. A character move 10 kilometers in one second? Yeah, just calculating that outright is close enough. You're not taking into account acceleration rate or time, but it's close enough. A character survived a nuclear blast in the face? Eh, calculating that's fine enough. Sure, the surface area is a generalization and not going through all the numbers and scaling every individual measurement to determine exactly the number of joules that was on that person's body, but it's close enough. The better parts of the verse community will not shy away from how a lot of our calculations and formulas go by the manner of close enough because it's just a silly little hobby done for fun that isn't to be taken super seriously. And both the side of the community that is incredibly hoity-toity and so full of themselves that they shit Matroshka dolls of themselves, and the outsiders who harass and entirely degrade the hobby for being pseudoscientific as if they have some sort of moral high ground, need to understand that. Power scaling being innately pseudoscientific is no more reason to denote the entire hobby and everyone who partakes in it as somehow wrong for doing so then it is to say that being an avid fan of Neon Genesis Evangelion and discussing all the symbolism and meaning behind it is entirely invalidated by the fact that the show is fictional. Some might consider that to be false equivalency, but I don't, because in both cases it's degrading someone's hobbies and the depths to which they will go to enjoy them simply for the fact that the topic is innately unrealistic. Sure, there is more meaning to be gleaned from analyzing the meaning behind them. That is a clunky sentence. 
Sure, there is more value to be gleaned from analyzing the meaning behind a piece of media than there is to versus analyze it, but that doesn't inherently make you a superior person. Alright, where were we? Ah, okay. Characters will rarely demonstrate their power outright, for the simple reason that authors do not think about this sort of thing. And that can lead to sometimes inconsistencies within stories, but that's not the point here. But let's talk about one of the biggest arguments I've seen against this hobby. The winner is determined by the writer. People love to throw around a certain quote by Stan Lee, which, first of all, what's up with all the people turning the words of a dead man into a form of harassment to claim the moral high ground? Ha good job. But mostly, that statement is entirely true. But I don't think it really understands the logic behind versus debating. And this comes down to more of a difference of approach than either side being wrong. Did I seriously just pronounce it approach? Usually, people outside of the community, and even some inside, will assume that versus debating is entirely meaningless because if it was an actual crossover, it'd come down to whatever the writers want. And the feats do not matter because writers do not write with these feats in mind. But not only do I think that's not applicable, but sometimes writers do. If we go back to Dragon Ball, Akira Toriyama, while not striving for everything to be perfectly versus debater mindset-y, did write with the power of characters in mind. When he postulated Frieza as absurdly powerful because he could freely annihilate planets with a flick of his finger, he didn't do so thinking, oh, the actual thing he did itself doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter that he can destroy a planet, all that matters is the vague idea that he's strong. Clearly, him being able to annihilate planets is important because that's what's used to denote the absurd threat that Frieza is. Alongside, like, a lot of other things, of course, like how he's framed in the narrative and how our heroes are struggling against foes that shit their pants at the idea of looking at Frieza funny. But his power being planetary is important to the narrative. That's literally how the arc ends. Then the next villain came, and he didn't ignore that Cell would naturally be stronger than Frieza. He decided to denote the exact point of difference between them as, oh yeah, Frieza can destroy a planet, well, Cell can destroy the entire solar system, so suck shit. And that's not exclusive to Dragon Ball. Feats do matter sometimes, whether or not you dislike that they do, because I understand that not everyone likes power creep. But sometimes they do matter. It is not as cut and dry as no writers think it matters or all writers think it matters. And this can even apply with crossover versus media too. When Midway made Mortal Kombat vs DC Universe, they clearly took note of how powerful DC was in comparison. So a plot point is made to even that out. Regardless, I think the narrative point doesn't matter, because that is simply not applicable to the approach taken for most versus debates. And if you disagree with that approach, it's not because either side is wrong. It's just because you prefer a different approach. The approach of versus debates is not who would win if there was an official crossover between these characters written by the original authors. It's who should logically win based off what they've shown to be capable of. These are, while similar, entirely different questions. And to assume that one is inherently better than the other is, in my opinion, not justifiable. And that does apply to people in the versus community who think that our approach is objectively better. In both cases, it's all up to audience interpretation. The latter approach often used by us obviously requires the interpretation of the author intended the character to be capable of accomplishing this feat. So how strong is this feat whether or not the author is aware of that? Not all authors are aware of how impressive what they write is. Writers of Godzilla vs Kong didn't know exactly how powerful Godzilla blasting into Hollow Earth was, just that it was in fact impressive. The writers of the original Transformers cartoon didn't know exactly how impressive it was that Megatron can survive an explosion that launches planets across space, but they wrote him as able to survive it anyway. And Akira Toriyama did not write Freezer Destroying Namek exactly aware of the amount of energy that the feat as demonstrated would require to pull off, but he wrote it anyway. Authors obviously don't always think about that side, the Verse community as that on its own, which is its own form of expanding the source material to have a debate. However, what I don't think people realize is that the other side, that is, arguing based on how characters are portrayed overall and how they would be in a crossover, is also expanding on the source material just in a different way. Arguing who would win based on pre-established narrative beats and themes is, in a sense, arguing that you think you know how the authors would write a crossover when you don't. It is still speculative. It is just speculative in a way that's even more subjective than the mathematic approach to a point of being even more meaningless. And arguing that the entire idea of arguing who should win is pointless because obviously the writer determines who wins is entirely reductive in nature. The same argument can be made in any other form of comparison. 
Arguing what two fictional characters is better is meaningless because it's just whoever the person reading or watching likes more than the other. Arguing what food is better is meaningless because it's just whatever the person eating likes more. Arguing what side the toilet paper should be on the wall is meaningless because it's just whatever side the person puts it on. And arguing whether or not versus debating is meaningless is meaningless because it's just whatever the person arguing considers it. And with these examples, you may notice that, yeah, these are things that in a sense are meaningless, but people argue about them anyway. These things at their best can foster interactions, different ways of looking at things, an understanding of different perspectives. It just seems meaningless to someone with no real investment because they don't have that investment. To people who care though, it's not meaningless. It's not meaningless to argue who wins because for any number of reasons, plenty of people have fun with it. That's the meaning. The meaning isn't the blank, emotionless, pointless argument of this character wins or this character wins. The meaning is the fun people have doing it. People enjoy it. People like going through feats. People like finding out how powerful characters are. People like the process of calculating and measuring. People like the process of arguing and debating. That is the meaning. And just because in the grand scheme of your life it is meaningless, doesn't mean people can't find meaning in those moments they have doing these things. Yes, the author would determine who wins if there was a crossover, but that reductive argument has no place in this hobby because it undermines the point. Arguing who'd win based on who you think the author would have win is to assume you know the author well enough to know who they'd have win, which can be fun as speculation, but doesn't offer much of a debate. And just not arguing at all because you shrug and just say, ah, oh, whatever, is boring and doesn't let people engage in their hobbies because someone else decided that something unrelated has rendered their argument pointless. The same people who argue that versus debating is pointless because the author decides who wins are also the same people who, well, argue that versus debating is pointless, despite the fact that the meaning and point of it is determined by the personal investment and interest of the parties involved. It is a meaningless and reductive argument that routinely quotes a dead and widely beloved man to twist his words into a form of harassment and bullying. And to be clear, I'm not saying that every single person who argues versus debating is pointless does this, or that every single person who uses that one Stan Lee quote is doing so to harass others, but it is a very common theme, and it is often done as a means of demeaning and looking down on people for their hobbies. I'm sure everyone watching this knows in some way how it feels to be looked down on by others because you like something and care about something that they don't see the value in. And to understand that feeling and push it onto others is something that can happen without one realizing. But that doesn't mean it should be done. People should come to just accept that they don't agree with the nature of the hobby. But if others do, that's fine. But people, will, people just love to fight and argue and cause discourse over it. Even though that they're arguing over something that by the same metric is pointless. I think to some extent, what a lot of outsiders, and as said before, even members within the community don't realize is that versus debating is just a hobby like any other. We don't need to demean others for being or not being into it. We don't need to start discourse and harassment campaigns and send out death threats over it any more than we need to for other hobbies. If you can look at someone who is a fan of a show, game, comic book, movie, anime, novel, or even genre of music that you personally don't like or may not see any value in and accept that they just have a different opinion than you, why is it so hard to do the same for a hobby like versus debating? And to the same extent, if you have a great and strong interest in versus debating, you don't have to be obnoxious about it and force it onto everyone, including those who don't care. Perhaps a big reason that discourse between power scalers and non-power scalers exists comes down to non-power scalers seeing Twitter posts and videos dedicated to the hobby that are by the most obnoxious and toxic people, and assuming that all of us are like that. Which, you know, I guess some of us now know how Sonic and My Little Pony fans feel. Some of us even being Sonic and My Little Pony fans. That said, there is another thing I feel like bringing up related to power scaling that is important. What is scaling? People often get confused by scaling. They will argue things like, I can survive being punched by Mike Tyson, that doesn't make me as strong as Mike Tyson, or I can hit Mark Henry in the back of the- Ah, uh, not enough people know who Mark Henry is. I can hit Bruce Lee in the back of the head and knock him out. That doesn't mean I'm strong or as fast as Bruce Lee. And they think they've argued against scaling. Bam! Take that, atheist. You've won. You're wrong. First of all, when dealing with numbers as vast as these, you are outright wrong. It is a fact that you are 
when on this scale, within the same range of strength as Mike Tyson and Bruce Lee. Because, and before you start arguing in the comments about that, the range of strengths I'm talking about is just the total range of human possibility. Bruce Lee and Mike Tyson are most likely faster and stronger than you watching this. But Mike Tyson is not literally millions of times stronger than the average person. The average person can punch with around 100 joules from what I could find, and Mike Tyson has punched with 1600 joules. That is only 16 times greater than the average person. And within the context of real life, that is insanely impressive. I would not want to be in the path of that fist. I would fucking flop to the ground. But when we're talking about something like, for example, one character survives a punch from someone who hits with a force of 10,000 kilotons, and they're fighting someone who is as strong as a normal person, then just because in real life you can take a hit from someone stronger than you, that doesn't mean that person one is not demonstrably more tough than the person who is as strong as a normal guy. The gap between Mike Tyson and you is not even a thousand times. The gap between an African bush elephant and you is within the thousands of times. A gap between a tenth of a kiloton of TNT and you is an order of billions. That is the level of gap we're looking at. You could multiply your strength by the number of people who exist on this planet and it would not be enough to match a kiloton of TNT. So arguing you can take a punch from someone stronger than you that doesn't mean you're as strong as them doesn't matter because in comparisons like these the gaps are so large that just being within a range of a hundred times below someone still makes you significantly stronger than another person. And that I think is part of the problem is that a lot of outsiders to the community see things with a realism view. They see things the way things work in real life. But this is fiction, and gaps in power in fiction can be significantly higher than they can be in real life. That said, yes, unless a character is explicitly stated in no uncertain terms to be equivalent to or above another, scaling is indeed just a matter of they're within a certain range of another character. And this, is, this can... I just hit my mic. And this can often be reflected in debates. If a character scales to 100 kilotons of TNT and another scales to 1 megaton of TNT, that does not mean the 1 megaton of TNT character inherently beats the 100 kiloton one by virtue of power alone. They certainly have the advantage in strength, the same way that Mike Tyson has the advantage in strength against someone 100 times weaker, but that doesn't mean that every single time, no matter the circumstances, that he will win. And most of the time, when characters are considered by those debating to be within a relatively similar range of tens, sometimes even a few hundreds or thousands, depending on the leniency of the debaters, that will not be the only necessary deciding factor. So, yes, it is correct to say that just because you can take a punch from Mike Tyson doesn't mean you're as strong as him, but that is not an argument against scaling as a whole. You are within a range of a couple hundred or a thousand, if you want to go that far, times below or higher below most likely Mike Tyson. You are not millions of times weaker than Mike Tyson. You are not completely vaporized by getting punched by Mike Tyson. You have never been punched by Mike Tyson. Why am I talking like you have? This can transition into the case where a lot of times people outside the community will consider versus debating as inherently dismissive of a character and their meaning. Sometimes this can feel like the case. Superman honestly doesn't really fit in my eyes. We can debate him, and those like him, sure, but it does feel like sometimes it is going against a lot of what the point is to look at him from this lens. However, people outside the community don't seem to realize that versus debaters do not exclusively talk about characters in this manner. In fact, the very nature of matchups coming from connections and rivalries goes against that notion. People see versus debaters versus debating and assume that that's the only way they look at the characters, because that's the only time they've seen them talk about characters. Which is just because the only way to identify someone as a versus debater is to see them do that thing. But in the same way that seeing someone play a Sonic game doesn't mean they only play Sonic games, seeing someone debate a character's power doesn't mean they only look at the character that way. While I personally do not like matchups that try to cram a million connections between characters in, I do understand that most of the time, these sort of mashups arise because of the passion and love the person making them has for the characters, the franchises, and a misguided desire to prove their matchup better due to the competitive nature of this hobby. People will go on and on about matchups based on themes and connections, 
specifically because they love the characters for more than their power levels and they love elements about them. Speaking entirely anecdotally, Destoroyer vs Iris from Godzilla and Gamera is my most wanted matchup for Death Battle of all time and my third favourite matchup in general. This has nothing to do with the versus side of it. It's because I love these kaiju, I love what they represent in their series, I love the meaning behind them, what they do and the thematic purpose of their existence within their films, and those parallels between them are present enough for me to want to see them fighting one another. But wanting to see them fight one another is not inherently the end goal. I also just love these two and love how one can compare the approach taken by the series towards similar ideas. And most people I know don't have a most wanted or favourite matchup based on the versus debating aspect of how close they are or how many mountains or universes they can shit out of existence. I have friends like Biffwee, whose favourite matchups tend to be because he likes the characters a lot and thinks that these simple but effective similarities between them are enough in his mind to make him want to see them fight and interact, regardless of who wins or who arbitrarily punches the best, or Huan whose favourite matchups tend to be a combination of how much he loves the characters and his love for seeing creative and weird ideas tackled in animation, his love of seeing the potential for wackiness expressed in a visual form. Ask anyone, any versus content creator, any versus debater, any casual fan of power scaling, and unless they're amongst the obnoxious group who live in a perpetual void of self-indulgent aggrandizing, they will tell you that their most wanted, their favourite matchups, the battles they personally like the most, are not based on who wins or how powerful either character is, but how much they love the characters themselves. And yes, there are groups who don't like matchups that are stomps, that are extremely one-sided. This is not because they only see the characters as stats. It's because one, they can often like the character who loses enough that they want to see them not completely eat shit, or because they actually like the debate side of it and want to see a good debate. Which might seem like it's degrading the characters as just numbers, but often, that's because they like the characters and want to see a debate with those characters because they like them. Versus debating can come across as if it doesn't care about the characters, but looking more than skin deep will reveal that if anything it's the opposite. Versus debating is in a weird sense a very silly nerdy way to express one's love of characters. Is it dorky? Yes. Is it weird? Absolutely. Is it completely stupid in a ton of ways? It wouldn't be fun if it wasn't. But is it representative of a group of media illiterate dullards who refuse to engage with what they watch or play? Not even remotely. This segment was about explaining scaling. Okay, back on track, because I want to wrap this up. Scaling is often used because characters usually don't demonstrate feats equivalent to how strong they should be on even ground with others. For example, Goku has never destroyed a planet. Not even close. His direct feats, not even close. Pre-Super! Pre-Super! But... He has shown himself to be capable of matching the energy attacks of characters who can destroy planets. If Goku did not possess enough power to destroy a planet, then it literally would make no sense for him to be able to match that. And for another Dragon Ball example, Vegeta and Broly, they've never destroyed a universe. They've never even come close to destroying a universe. I don't count the Dimension Shatter as destroying a universe, that's breaking the bounds between dimensions, which is something we have no metric for in real life. But for them to match and even exceed the raw power of Goku, they'd have to be capable of potentially destroying a universe the way Goku could potentially destroy a universe as shown in his battle with Beerus. If they didn't have a similar range of power, then they shouldn't be able to take Goku down within the context of how they did. That is why scaling is used. Is it lame? It can be, yes. It's definitely a lot cooler to analyze how strong a character is because of the cool shit they did, instead of because of the cool shit a character they're as strong as did. But it's fine, that's, that's, your mileage will vary on that one. And speed is the same. Goku Black has never pulled off any feats of speed as impressive as Goku, but if he was really infinitesimally slow comparatively to Goku, he'd be moving in slow motion in comparison. And I will say, because this is important, context always matters when it comes to scaling. A lot of people outside of the community look at us and assume that scaling is along the lines of, well Yamcha bodied Goku, so clearly he's as strong as Goku when he fought Beerus. They'll think that we think that way. But both people who do actually think that way, and people who think the majority of the verse community thinks that way, you're entirely wrong. You either don't understand or intentionally misrepresent what scaling actually is. Scaling is always heavily based in context. Any power scaler who actually knows what they're doing, and 
also has experience with Dragon Ball, will tell you that the example of Yamcha beating Goku doesn't work because when Yamcha fought Goku, that was long before Goku ever achieved his power in Super Saiyan God. Yamcha is comparable to Goku, but only what Goku accomplished at the time when using this example, as opposed to anything that happened after that. Similarly, a power scaler will bring up context to any other straw man people would attempt to use. No, we would not scale Boros to Saitama off the logic of, well look, they're clearly fighting each other, they scale. Because the context of that is that Saitama is holding back and only going as hard as necessary to make Boros think that he's found an equivalently strong opponent as opposed to someone innumerably stronger than him. Obviously, Boros would only be comparable to the most casual of feats Saitama has accomplished, and those feats are not even a fraction of what Saitama's full power is. Similarly, a surprise attack would not make you scale in speed. The straw man of attacking by surprise is straight up something we would not argue for due to context. People who think we would argue that you're faster than Bruce Lee because you took him by surprise, they're wrong! All things in a fight or encounter are considered when scaling. It's just that versus debaters often know this in advance. So when they talk to each other, they do so with the understanding that another versus debater already knows that the context is considered. Sometimes the context itself can even be debated. But to someone without the knowledge that context is already considered, they can sometimes assume based on what they see that context is not being acknowledged at all. They're wrong. It's understandable that they might think that, but if they did any research or looked at all at the conversations versus debaters have, they would understand that context is taken into consideration. Scaling and comparing characters is not something that ignores context, because context is the most important fundamental part of all power scaling. Competent power scalers do not scale characters to one another if one was holding back by a huge amount, nor would we scale someone to an opponent who is demonstrably faster than them just because they fought, unless there was context to back up why they should scale. Like, if they got a speed boost that put them on even grounds or something. This is also why off-screen fights and fights that took place in lore only can sometimes be debated against in the community because we don't know all the context to it. And for a final little note, people love bringing up aim dodging. Yeah, no, power scalers also take that into account. When discussing feats of dodging lasers, lightning, gunfire and stuff, it is considered. People outside the community think that we don't consider that, but if a character visually aim dodges, oftentimes we'll throw the feat out the window. We don't tend to bring up the specifics again because between power scalers is an understanding. That context is lost with outsiders. Calcs often are how far a character moved relative to how far the projectile moved, and reacting to projectile weapons is pretty much only ever acknowledged if the character starts moving after the projectile has been fired, and does something in the time it takes for that projectile to reach where they were at the time it was fired. There's more to power scaling that can be talked about, like consistency, high balls and low balls, and these are all things that power scalers take into consideration that people outside of the hobby just assume that they don't which is due to the most part because power scaling media is primarily made for people who already have that context. And there is always something of a double standard. I brought up Dragon Ball a lot today because it's a series that people are supremely lenient with in ways they do not give to other series, which, yeah, is because bias is a factor you can never truly get rid of. But that can be said of all things. Even scientific analysis of actually important topics can be affected by things like confirmation bias and a desire to see your hypothesis proven. It's unavoidable. There's no reason that the power scaling community should be ridiculed for it more than any other group. What's the point of this video then? Well, I guess to say that to anyone not in the power scaling community, please stop talking about us, what we think, and how we treat characters when dealing with our hobby as if you have an intimate knowledge of it. It is completely fine to disagree with the underlying concept, with the logical through line we use, to not be able to see characters' feats and stuff in this way. It's fine to think it's a waste of time, but it's never okay to harass others and be as vitriolic as some of you, some, of you can be simply because of that fact and i have to stress because people will take me out of context to assume that i'm saying that everyone outside of the community acts like this not even close to it just there are people who do power scaling is a hobby those who enjoy it do so for reasons that clearly those who don't will not be able to agree with but that does not mean that either side is right or wrong for how they feel when you see people power scaling it's not right to just assume that's all they care about that they are somehow disrespecting or disregarding the purpose of the media that they're talking about. 
People can have all sorts of hobbies, and a vast majority of the friends I have in this community are fully capable of enjoying media for what it's meant to be enjoyed for. They have plenty of hobbies that are more important to them than this one. It's just a bit of silly fun that we like, and most of the assumptions made about us, about how we tackle things, how we treat certain elements, are simply wrong. Not wrong for everyone, there are always bad apples. That That's the case for any fandom, or to be honest, any group of people with a large enough size. When those bad apples are the minority, and the group isn't like actively harmful, like I don't know, a bunch of racists, then there's no reason to judge that group for just the worst parts of it. Sure, your assumptions about us may be right for the worst of us, but it's not right to lump everyone in with them as if everyone is like that. And at the same time, power scalers in the Versus community need to stop acting as if those not within the sphere of this hobby are somehow wrong for not being in it, and to some extent, maybe we should be mindful about how we come across. Arguing with those outside of the community as if we are to expect them to have context might not necessarily be the way to go about it, though I am not blind to the fact that a lot of the heated arguments come from both sides being dickheads. Rarely is one side completely free of blame, and that's understandable. There are definitely problems with this community, huge ones that cannot be overlooked. The needless harassment thrown out by members of it, the overabundance of those who take it way too seriously and treat it like it's the only thing that matters, an unintentional trend of non-white ethnicities being treated as somehow abnormal and unlike others when conceiving matchups, double standards in terms of respect shown towards religious practices and different beliefs, and so many other problems, but none of them are to do with the very nature of power scaling, or the idea behind the hobby itself. Those people who are obnoxious in the community will be obnoxious in other communities they're in too. It's not a thing exclusive to the versus community. Power scaling is not the problem. The hobby is not the problem. The community has a lot of good in it, a lot of great people, a lot to offer. It is a hub that at its best can be an amazing place for people to find and experience new media, new franchises, shows and games they may never have. When the community is good, it's one of the most amazing places to be. And when it's bad, it's one of the most insufferable and wretched things one can experience, which to some extent, is, as I said, like any other fandom if we're being honest. I just hope people can come to understand power scaling a bit better. Not only that, as power scalers, we do take into account a lot of the factors that we're accused of not taking into account, but also that it's just a silly little hobby we like. Everyone has silly little things they enjoy, regardless of how superfluous it may be in the long run. Be it playing video games or versus debating, we're all here to have some fun, right? And when you think of it that way, What's the harm in the end, huh? You know, all that said, um, please don't use this video as a means to attack others. Please do not look at people who assume things wrong about us and that obnoxiously go, well, actually, you're wrong because Nemesis Bloodreich said this in a video. Argue in your own words if you want, and please be respectful about it. This is not here to start discourse or drama. If anything, this is a response to drama to try and quell some of it by explaining things in a way that is not going, uh, fuck you and everything you believe in. I tried my hardest with this video to, to drill into the minds of people that it is okay to disagree with versus debating, it's okay to not like the approach, it's okay to think it's silly and dumb, even people in the community can often think it's silly and dumb. Please do not start drama over this video, please don't make me into a weapon, I will KILL YOU!